many billionaires do you think are in the United States right now? They, you know, they say we used to be the richest nation. Some people argue with what's happening uh, when it comes to being rich in the country and who's the richest nation. But um, we obviously live in a great country. How many billionaires, though, billionaires, do you think live in the United States? You say five? Okay. Any other guesses? What? Four? You want one lower? Seven? I looked it up this morning and it's actually it says six hundred it's six hundred and sixty. That's way more than I thought we would see, right? That's way more than I thought. You would think in the richest nation as we are, uh, we're we're worth more than the next three richest countries in the world put together. Out of out of all these billionaires though, you would think that we are eating the meat and drinking the sweet. It's a lot of money, right? Thinking about that much money flowing around, you would think that we're, we'd all be eating and drinking. That everything would be great. Uh, however, a recent study showed that 38 million American families, about one out of every three U.S. households, is living hand to mouth. Hand to mouth. That is, they have just enough to survive day to day. Okay? So, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this. But how many of you, in your mind, you can answer yourself. How many of you today think you're living hand to mouth? Whether you're barely making, making it to the end of the month. Or maybe you have enough money and you're set for life. Every single person on this planet lives to what I'm going to call is hand to mouth. You're going to see what I mean by this in just a minute. When you when I say you're living from hand to mouth, you're kind of thinking about your own your own earnings, your own provisions, what you what you can give to yourself, what food you feed to yourself, what food you purchase at the store, what food you grow, right? Every single person on this planet lives from hand to mouth. What do I mean? Okay, this is the subject we're going to get into. And how this applies to you is what this means. We're talking about, we've been talking about the Israelites being saved from bondage in Egypt. And they were moved into an area where their backs were against the wall. Uh, and they needed God to intervene, right? And he did. In the last, I mean, they were up against the wall and they didn't know where it was going to come from and then, you know, God came in and swooped in and he, he saved it, right? Uh, we're studying the life of Moses. The life of Moses uh, no, is, a great, is great to learn from. Moses is one of the three greatest figures in the Old Testament. So when you think of the Old Testament, you know, you think about Moses. If God had a Mount Rushmore, Moses' face would be up there, right? When you study his life, you realize that he was a human just like you, just like you, if you're watching the video or you're here today. He went through things just like you, and his family went through those things, and he suffered the pains that you go through. The way that God worked in his life is the way God's going to work in your life. It's going to be the same for you. It's going to be the same. God will work in your life the same way because we all face things like they did, like the Israelites did. Now, the last time we left Moses uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, their delivery. They had just walked through the Red Sea. If you haven't seen that, there's, uh, we have the video of that. Uh, when you're backed up against the wall, I encourage you to read that or, or take a look at that. Just as God had promised, he delivered them from the Egyptians. And now they're ready to start making a journey into Canaan, the promised land. So now we pick up the story. They've just been, you know, miraculously saved. And uh, now they're in the desert. Now we're going to pick up the story, and this is where we make an application for you. Would you pray with me before we read this verse in the Bible? Dear God, we want to approach you. We give this message to be in your care. 
humbly as this information is presented, dear God, we pray that your spirit will be with us and that you do a miracle in our hearts. And that you reach out to us, and those that are watching, so that they can see the sense of giving God thanks and being having gratitude for all the good gifts that you've given us. We thank you. Please be with us during this message. In the name of Jesus. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. I really think whatever life you live, you're going to find a direct application with you as we pick up this story, chapter 16. No. I'm going to begin reading to you in verse, verse 1, and we're going to read three verses. I just want you to think about what's happening, and what God gives them is amazing. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So there they were. Verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They were just saved. Now they're in the wilderness and already they come into this valley and they're starting to complain. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would that we had died in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They're already starting to complain. You think, well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't complain. God just saved me. I just seen a miracle. It was miraculous. What? I would never do that. But we do it. And you're going to see an application of this that you can, you can apply to your life. And you're going to see areas where you're tested by complaining and murmuring, whether it's to the church or whether it's in your personal life, whether it's with your relationship with God. Verse 4, then the Lord said unto Moses, now the Lord's listening to them. I mean, it doesn't look great, right? The Israelites are complaining. But God, you know, he's listening. God says in verse 4, the Lord said unto Moses, behold, I know, I know they're having a hard time. They're hungry. They're in the wilderness. I get it. They're complaining. They're uncomfortable. So he says, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out, day, out and gather a certain amount every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So I'm going to be with you. I'm going to, I'm going to test you. I'm going to give you, though, what you need. I'm going to see if you really walk with me. You continue to do it. Verse 5, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day thou shalt prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At evening, then, ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then, ye shall see the glory of the Lord, because ye heard your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? We're just men, that's what he's saying. You complain about us. But we're just men, I'm just a man, right? That's what he's saying. And the Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread of the full. For the Lord heard your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but they're against God, the Lord. Let's stop there. I don't know how this information is going to affect you if you're watching or if you're here. You might find it to be sensitive for you. Maybe you're in a place in your life where you're doing a lot of complaining. Or maybe at some point you can check yourself and you'll see that that spirit is coming through with you. Okay. The whole Israelite community sets out. They find themselves out here in this vast, you know, territory. The Israelites uh, said, uh, oh, if only we would have died in Egypt. There's another important event. We know that this event is important because not only is the account presented in detail, this event, but it's also discussed again and again and again throughout the Bible. So it's not just a story that we can forget. It is, it is refreshed in our mind into the New Testament so that we can remember this story. It is mentioned throughout the books of the Bible. Five in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. First, we're told the exact time it took place. On the 15th day of the second month that they had come out of Egypt. 
It had been exactly one month since they crossed the Red Sea and been delivered. Do you think that would have been too soon for them to forget what God just did? You would think, well, it's been 30 days. He just opened a river and saved us. And we watched an army fall. 30 days later, this is where we find out. So, well, that would never happen to me. But it happens to you. It does happen to you. So I want you to think about it. Give thought to this. These are people that are like us. They barely start their journey and they're already grinding and complaining. In fact, it's not the first time. They complained just before they crossed the Red Sea. Do you remember that? Before, remember we talked about it. They were getting ready to cross the Red Sea and they complained. They did it then. They were complaining. I know about it. Nice to see you. So it's not the first time the Israelites were complaining. They complained just before they crossed the Red Sea that they were going to die. They already thought they were going to die. They put it in their minds they were going to die. They were complaining, you brought us here to die? Now they're in the wilderness, 30 days later. And they're complaining again. What? Are we going to starve to death here? Same complaint, right? Questioning God's provisions. Questioning God if God's going to intervene for them. Do we do that? We do. We do it. In the previous chapter, they complained because they couldn't find good water to drink. Now they're complaining because, well, they're hungry. Have you ever complained because you're hungry? Oh, yeah. You get hungry. How do you act when you're hungry? You're hungry. You're mean. Hungry. You're hangry. <laughs> you're rational. <laughs> Short. You can't think straight. You can't get things done. You can't focus right. You're not going to make good decisions. Right? Yes. Dulce gets mad because uh, she doesn't get a subway her way. She gets mad, she says, no way. Is that right, Dulce? Dulce gets mad? It's so weird. She doesn't have to subway. <laughs> One of the things that you're going to see throughout the Bible, throughout the book of Exodus and Numbers, uh, is this recounting of this journey of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. Egypt to Canaan. Canaan is the land that's full of milk and honey. But this journey is not so easy getting there. How much complaining and griping and moaning and groaning they do. Every one of them had to do with food. All their complaining then was food. It was all about food. Complaining and complaining and complaining. God, you brought us out here to die? What? They weren't happy with their living conditions. Their drinking. You have to wonder, why did God let them get thirsty? And then in this chapter, he lets them get hungry. Take a little effort. You, where's your faith? Yeah. Faith. faith do you believe it? Faith. Faith. Why does God let us faith. go through times of need? Faith. Hardship and difficulty. Think about it. If everything in your life was wonderful and great, why would you need God? You wouldn't need God, right? God wouldn't be on your mind. You would never learn to rely and trust on God. Right? They complain and they complain. They were getting tired. God is trying to teach us what He is trying was trying to teach them. And that is that every single day of your life you live from His hand to your mouth. That's what I mean. From His hand to your mouth. That's what He's trying to teach you, like He tried to teach you your life. This isn't about you taking care of you. God is trying to teach us what he had to teach them. Every day you live is from his hand to your mouth. He doesn't just hold the whole world in his hand. He holds the whole breath that you breathe in his hand. Everything. Your lungs. He holds the beat of your heart in his hand. He holds the time of your life in his hand. We're going to learn real quick today five things about God and about our life. Daily life that I hope will, will help you and help us. So that we don't find ourselves like these grieving, grieving people. But that we're full of gratitude, not of complaining, but celebrating. And how to wander through the wilderness of life without complaining so much. And forgetting that God is real. And he's there for us. And I, I think that we're forgetting. The harder things get, the harder it is to remember that God is right there and He's made these promises of provision to you. 
So we give up. When God was right there to help you. And sometimes we give up too fast. God has promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob he would bring their descendants into Canaan. He promised them, I'm going to take you all the way to Canaan. Don't worry. You're going to make it. I promise you. Right? I'm going to get you to Canaan. This is, you're going to love the land. It's called the land of you know, flowing with milk and honey. It was a, a fruitful land. Not like this desert they were going through. Imagine traveling in our deserts here for 40 years. Right? God said, I'm going to take you to this land of Canaan. And he keeps his word. If the Israelites had just believed God and remembered that, remembered it, remembered the promise that God does, does what he promises, they wouldn't have been right. They would have been waiting. They would have been trusting. Trusting. Because it was God's job to make sure that the nation made it. His promise was the nation would make it. They would have trusted him. So God says one thing to Moses that should have ended all of the discussion. This is what God says to Moses. Should have stopped it all. And with this, God, it should have stopped the complaining. God says this one thing to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. I hear you complaining. I hear it. So he goes to Moses and he says, you know, take this back. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do for you. It's going to rain down from heaven. Notice immediately this bread was not something found in the bakery. He wasn't providing it from, you know, a few fishes and some loaves of bread. This meal had to last for 40 years. 40 years. It didn't come from any plant or animal on earth. It was not man-made. It wasn't something the Israelites brought with them from Egypt. It wasn't something they had to make and bake. God was the source of the bread. He was the source. God sent that bread directly from heaven. It was bread made in heaven's eye, right? How many of you have heard the story before? How many of you have heard the story before? But that's, there's even more I'm saying. Hundreds of years later, a psalmist named Asaph referring to this incident. Hundreds of years later, this is what the psalmist said. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He raised down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. That's what the Bible says. He gave them grain from heaven. A miraculous provision. Human beings, human beings ate it. They could live on it. It kept them healthy. It was the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. Where did it come from? This was angel food cake, right? Heaven was the bakery, and God was the maker and the baker. So we read, every quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost was on the ground that appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is this? For they didn't know what it was, and Moses said to them, it is the bread of the Lord. He has given it to you to eat. Pretty miraculous, right? Wow, the Israelites get another, you know, miracle. Nowhere else, at no other time, did God feed his people like this ever again. It's only recorded right here. It only happened there. It was a food that was only eaten one time uh, by one people, one place, and never eaten again. We read about it. The Bible through centuries talks about it. They didn't even know what to call it, so they finally said this. In verse 34, and the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron, put the manna with the tablets of the covenant, the Lord, the covenant law, so that it could be preserved. There's your word, manna. Now it's got a name. Put the manna with the covenant law. The word manna comes from the Hebrew manhu, which means, who knows what that means? No, but that's a great guess. Doesn't mean it. Very simple. You know what it means? What is it? It means what is it? <laughs> they didn't know what to call it. Have you ever heard of a mystery meat? <laughs> well, it's exactly what the Israelites are eating. It's a mystery food. They didn't know. That. I don't know about you, but I, you know, there's certain places in the world that if I seen certain kinds of meat, I wonder what it was. What am I eating? You'd have to ask them. What uh, have you ever eaten a meal? And you say, Hey, what kind of meat is this? this is a, you know, this is a meat, right? Yeah. Okay, so what is this? I know it might be sometimes rude, but it might be good to ask what you eat. Right? <laughs> Pastor gives a story about one day he's up 
One Sunday afternoon, uh, there was a sister that had a special meal for him and his wife. He, she invited him to come eat, so they went to eat. She, she fed them this plate with this meat, put it on the table with vegetables. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's actually a little different. Tasted it. Hmm. So they asked her, what is this? She said, it's a turtle. It's a turtle. A turtle. So the pastor asked her, did you catch it? She said, oh, no, no, no. God is, God is so good. He just provides for me. She found it. She found it a while ago on the side of the road, and it was still warm. Probably not a good meal. Probably not good to eat, but yeah. <laughs> it might be good to ask what you're eating. <laughs> Depends on how If you're going to eat turtle off the side of the road, more makes you good. Okay. This bread dog manna. It was going to be their food for how many years? How many years do you think they had to eat this food from God? You say 25? That's a long time, right? Try it. How many? 40 years. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. They had this provision from God. It's the only way they could make it. It was the only food they could have. For 40 years, they had to eat God's provision. Looking back, do you think they were blessed? Oh. 40 years. There was two questions you never had to ask for 40 years. What? What is it? <laughs> What's for dinner? Right? What's for dinner? What are you going to make tomorrow? Do you imagine today if you're preparing for the week, right? Some people spend weekends, you know, shopping for the weekend. You don't have to ask that. It was either going to be fried manna, grilled manna, sauteed manna, baked manna, steamed manna, mashed manna, stewed manna, hot manna, cold manna. Yeah. What's that? What's that? Hurdle? Hurdle. Hurdle. <laughs> right. They never had to ask where it was going to come from. They never had to ask what it was going to be. But they knew it was from who? Every day. In their face. This is what I gave you. This is what I gave you so you don't have to worry. You don't have to. I heard you complain. This is what you got. Don't complain anymore. Do we get that? That's what God did for them. One of the biggest dangers as we, as, uh, that we face as God's children, one of the biggest sins we can commit, is we get so used to what God gives us on a daily basis just to stay alive. Just to stay alive. I think we're looking pretty good, right? We're all still here. We've got some drugs, but, you know, I could lose a few pounds. You know, right? We start taking things for granted. We start thinking that, that our R's... Uh, they came from our hand. Did you get that? That our ours, right? Our food, our money, our property, our right? You go on and on, right? Our ours are us. They're from us. That's what we think. Big mistake for you as a Christian. Uh, we forget of things coming from God's hand to us. Forget about it. Forget about it. We can't see him. We know we work hard. We forget about God's, God's role in our life, in our provisions. He gives you what you need. You're here. We forget about it. Just like they did. Just, just like they did. Right. That's correct. Let me, let me, uh, let me tell you what, what I'm thinking. How do you feel about this statement? God is the source of everything you have. God is the source of everything you have. God is our supply. Everything you have comes from God's house. Everything we have comes from God's hand. Five times in this chapter, we read the same thing over and over and over and over. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Moses said, you will know that it's from the Lord when, when He gives you meat to eat in the evening and all that bread you want in the morning. It's from God. There's no question. Every day when you wake up, you're reminded, God, God gave you this. And God's taking care of you. Bear in mind that the Lord has given you in the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, He gives you bread for two days to cover the Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? God put that thought process in with this plan of 
provide a meal for the nation of Israel. Then he says, take an omer of manna, keep it the generations to come. Keep it for the generations to come so they see the bread I gave you to eat. What do you mean by that? Keep a little bit of this, an omer of this, so that others can remember this. Why, did, why was that important? Because three generations away, what would happen? They would forget. Right? And if they forgot, how would that affect them thinking about God's provisions? Why would they rely on God? If they don't remember how God helped them in the past, right? Okay. Not only did God make the bread, God promised the bread. God promised Moses he would provide for them on their journey. Where God guides, God provides. Key point. Where God guides, God provides. If God is guiding you, he's going to provide for you. He promised Moses he would lead them on a journey, and where God leads, he provides. Where God leads, he feeds. Right? I'm going to lead you to Canaan, but I'm not going to give you nothing. Just get there. I hope you make it. It's not what God said. Where he leads them to, he's going to feed and take care of them. Remember, this was called angel food. Every morning, angels would deliver this heavenly catered meal and lay it right before them. <clears throat> they didn't have to work for it other than pick it up. They didn't have to pay for it. They didn't have to grind the flour. They didn't have to knead the dough. They didn't have to bake it over fire. All they had to do was take it and eat it. Complain? How easy could it have been for them? How hard, really? So let's murmur against the provision of God. Think about it. Every morning when they got up, God would hand them delivered groceries right at their front door, so to speak, right? He did it for 40 years. This wasn't like a two-week stand. 40 years. They didn't have to go to the grocery store. They didn't have to pay sales tax. They didn't have to stand at the checkout counter. Every single day, there was an unending supply of bread. It was delivered while they slept. They didn't see God deliver it. It came, you know, miraculously by his hand. Every morning you wake up in a, 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 from a bed, God would have it there waiting for you. You wake up in the morning, God gave it to you. He, he was giving you. You go to a job, God gave you. And you work that job with the help that God gave you in a car that God gave you. Do we forget? Yeah. Or do we feel like it's all from our hand? The Israelites forgot. Everything you have and everything that we, we have comes from God and it's given by God and He is our supplier. Be sure for 40 years what they had to eat, it was manna. I'm sure they boiled it, they baked it, they broiled it, they barbecued it, they breaded it, they buttered it, they grilled it, they sauteed it. They ate it hot, they ate it raw, they ate it cold, they ate it cooked. At least they knew they would never starve. Can you think of a food we eat today and there's like 20,000 ways to make it? Huh? That's a lot of time. Potatoes. You can bake it, you can, you know, fry it. You can do a lot with the potato. Right? Nobody had too much or too little of this food. This is what the Lord said. Part of our verse for today. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much. And some gathered a little. They were measured, they would measure it by this owner. The one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone, everyone had what? Just enough. Whatever you need. You know what? For 40 years. For 40 years you're gonna have it no matter what you get that day. Whatever you pick up. You got what you need. You need a little more next week? Don't worry about it. Go get it. It's going to be waiting for you. That's what God did. As much as they needed. And an omer is a little more than two liters. So I want you to imagine a two liter bottle of Coke that you buy at the grocery store. That is what they had every day. Apparently, it was a perfect amount for whatever you know that would do to their body, right? Maybe some would have a little more. Some would, but th that's how much would take care of them. Every day. Every person had the same amount of this honey-like, coriander, seed-like, miraculous supply. They... You would think the people of Israel would be grateful. But this is what we read in Numbers. This is later. Okay? They're in the wilderness. 
And I don't know how long it would take for you if you were eating baked potatoes for, say, 20 years, and that's all you have before you started complaining to the baker. Right? That's what they started doing. Numbers 11, verses 4 through 5. The, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, Ah, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt. Uh, at no cost also, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. What do they start to do again? Complain! How many gifts does God have to give you? <laughs> right? And ironically, we do the same thing as adults. In real life. I have a car. It gets me to work every day. I was blessed with that car. I was helped to get the car. But I, I, I know where that help came from. It was God's hand in my mouth. The job that I'm working at. I've been blessed there for seven years. I didn't do that. I prayed before I got that job. And I remember the call. That's from God's hand to my mouth. How many gifts can you think about where God helped you? And yet we still complain. Uh, let me just say this to you right here, right now. Hear me clearly. If you don't like what God gave you, the problem is not with what He has given you. The problem is with you. Are you following me on this? The problem is your appetite. You're not satisfied. Your appetite is different than God's. Chuck Swindoll says, uh, it takes a heavenly appetite to enjoy a heavenly diet. Do you know what happens to us? We get so used to having God's daily blessings in our life that we don't even think about it. And yet we should be in awe of them. So many good things that we enjoy every day. I can walk. I know someone who can. A very good friend. Thank you, God. From his hand, my mouth. And in other ways, that person is blessed. Thank you, God, from your hand to their hand. Here's the point. Every day that you live, God's going to give you what you need, and whatever you need, he's going to supply it for you. You may not be on this page with me, but it's that's what God offers you. The same God that took care of you yesterday is the same God that will take care of you today. Remember, He is the God who supplies. Now, what else is God? God's our security. Let's make an application of this. Verse 32, Moses says, This is what the Lord commands. Take an omer of manna and keep it for generations to come so they can see the bread that I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. How many days a week did, did Israel always have bread to eat? How many days a week did they always have bread? Seven days a week. Every day. How many weeks was that a year? 52. So how many years total? 40 years. Right? 40 years. God never missed a day. They never missed a meal. And what does that mean? He's not only our source and our supply, but he's your security. If God is your provision and security, it's not going to fail. Another key point. If the source of what you have dies... It's not from God. If his supply runs out, if your supply runs out, you're kind of out of luck, right? You're, you're, whatever your hand provides you might run out. But God's supply will not run out. If the source is eternal and the supply is unending, your eternity, your security is unlimited from God. I'm just thinking about it that way. There is nothing more insulting to God than to put your security in anything other than Him. Okay? If you put your security in the stock market, it crashes. You put security in the business, it goes bankrupt. You, you find your security in, in someone else or, or a partner or a human being, and they leave you or we die. We learned several years ago that you can put your security in what? Real estate, and what could happen? The real estate takes a dump, right? You could lose your shirt. Even Social Security isn't secure. For the future. What do they say? Uh, 
uh, it will be out of funds in 2033. Something like that. God is better than all of it. He's better than social security. He's better than financial security. He gives eternal security. He doesn't need 401k, stock markets, real estate, or cash on hand to meet your needs and to give you security. I'm not saying that we don't need those things. But I'm saying that God will find ways to provide for you. And I know some of us struggle for it. But we haven't went hungry. Sometimes we struggle, but God's there for us. We need God's security. He's the only one that gives it. Okay. God is our strength. There are three things that you have in order to survive. What are the three things you need right now to survive? You need Okay, air. Air is one of them I've got listed. Water. Air, water, and food. Is that what you can say, Bob? The Lord. Well, ultimately that's true, right? Physically we need food, air, and water, right? God knows this. Air was no problem. When you look long enough, you find rivers, streams, ponds, oasis. But enough for all these people. All these people. You have to have air to breathe and water to hydrate. But you have to have food and strength to make a journey. And think about the Israelites here. They've got to eat every day. Every day. That, uh, that manner represents the fact that God is the one that gives them the strength to go through it. And that's what he does for us. The manner represents that God gives us strength to go through whatever you're going through and face it. Any journey that you have, he's going to make it for you. A way out. You get those points? Wherever he wants you to go. Whatever plans he has for you. Whatever God is telling you he wants you to accomplish. He's going he's gonna to be there for you to make it through. There's one thing the Israelites had to do every day. Anybody have a thought on this? What did they have to do every day during that period? What did the Lord command them? He said, every one of you is to gather. To gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. It had to be what? Gathered. Right? The manna didn't just fall in their mouths while they were sleeping with their mouths open. Right? They had to get up, they had to go out, they had to pick it up, and they had to take it home. Even that was not enough. It was not enough to see the manna. It was not enough to gather the manna. You then had to what? Huh? Eat the manna. Okay. Food will not give you strength unless you eat it. You can put the best food in the world and eat from your mouth. And you know what will happen? Nothing. <laughs> It'll smell great. But you have to eat the food or you will die. You eat every day because you need strength every day. So what's the point of that? The manna represents something else. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. When the Israelites finally reached Canaan, they were to take some of the manna and then they were to lay it in the holy place of the tabernacle as a reminder of what God had done for them. Okay. Moses gave these words to Deuteronomy. Is what Moses said. Remember, remember how the Lord of your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Remember this, to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeds you with manna. Get that? He humbled you. He humbled you, causing you to hunger. And then he fed them which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the Lord. Do you know what manna represented really? God's word. The word of God. The most important strength we need every day to face, every day, is not the physical strength. It is spiritual strength. That is why we need every day to feed from God's Word. That is why if they tried to, you know, hoard the bread and kept it overnight, what would happen to it? Does anybody know what would happen if they if they hoarded it and they put it in a storage room with the manna? Rot. 
just like that. Wow. They couldn't even keep any extra. Why would they need to? It was always enough. Do you think there were some people who tried that? <laughs> sure there was. They needed to eat new manna every day, just like we today. Here, today. Uh, we feed on daily bread every day, God's Word. How many of you leave here and starve yourself the rest of the week? You don't. Do you? Spiritually? It happens, right? Yeah, I don't know what it's going to take for you. Spiritually starving, even after just gorged in the Right? Is that the way it is with food, too? Sometimes you'll eat a lot, and then the next day you're like, man, I ate so much yesterday, why am I so hungry today? Right? It's like that with God, too, with His Word. We have to start thinking of ways that we can take in daily food from God. If you're going to be a healthy, hearty, holy Christian, you've got to eat the bread of God's Word every single day. We were told here they weren't supposed to forget how God provided. This gives us new meaning to the Lord's Prayer when you say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You're not just praying for God to meet you physically, but you're also praying for God to take care of you spiritually. And you've got to pray for it because it doesn't happen naturally. It does not going to happen for you just naturally. You've got to make the effort to do it. Set a time to do it. We need to be reminded every day that God is your strength. <clears throat> now, this is the last part. This is the last uh, subject. God is your salvation. God is your salvation. There's a lot more to this story than, you know, meets the eye for this story. Without this bread, Israel is no more. Without this provision, this nation is gone. They would have died in the wilderness. They would have died. Without this bread, we never hear from them again. Never. This bread is their salvation. Have you ever watched a Christian die? Have you ever been sick? Almost dead? Because you're not eating? Oh. It's the reason they made it to the promised land. The bread is a picture of Jesus. I'm not making this up, right? This is what we read from the Bible. The bread is a picture of Jesus. I'm going to prove this to you. Exodus 16, 4. Listen to this. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Where was the bread from? It wasn't just heavenly bread. It was human bread. Uh, it was real bread, right? You could eat it. You could eat this bread. You could digest this bread. It was heavenly bread, and it was human bread. You follow me? It was from heaven, but it was human bread. Here's your food, right? 2,000 years ago, a baby was born in Bethlehem. He was born with a heavenly baby and a human baby. When Jesus looked back on this same manna, this is what he said in John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is calling himself the bread from heaven. He's not just the master. He was the manna. Think about it. So in John chapter 6, he continues, Sir, they said, always give us this bread. They thought Jesus was talking about the physical bread still. Like the whipper. They wanted to eat the same thing that their ancestors ate. We want that bread forever. But Jesus says in John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He gave Jesus to the whole world. The manna only gave physical life, but God's Son gives what? Eternal life. Eternal life. Just as the Jews had to go to that bread and get the bread and eat the bread, where do we have to go? Yes. We have to go to Jesus. We have to go to Him. We have to take of the bread of salvation. We have to taste and see that the Lord is good. And when we do, we won't have, you know, just physical life for today. You're going to have eternal life forever. 
The Jews ate that manna, but they eventually did what? They eventually died. Right? Sooner or later, the Jews died. After that provision was gone, they moved into the land of milk and honey. They started raising their food, uh, enjoying this productful abundance. But eventually, they died. But when you eat the bread of life, we live forever. I want you to remember that. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, we all live hand to mouth. We all live it. We're dead. Physically on this earth, we live from God's hand to our mouth. Spiritually in our hearts, we live from God's hand to our mouth. Eternally in the kingdom of God, we will still be living from His hand to our mouth. Even in the kingdom of God, that's how we're going to live. From God's hand to us. Do you know what? That's not only just the best way to live for eternal rewards, but the best way for us to live now. To know that God still loves us, cares for us. And when we complain, you know, we might look back and we might even get angry at the Israelites. But I'm going to tell you, if you've ever complained, you know exactly what God's thinking. He's already thought about how to take care of you. Amen?